subscription just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with Tom. Tom, how the heck have you been? It's been a wonderful, wonderful life. No, that's all holiday stuff, isn't it? Uh. <laughs> yeah, the holidays are behind us. They By are. the time everyone hears this, it's, they'll be like a month behind us. I know, we'll already be deep into January. Yes. We've got snow on the way, theoretically. I've heard that. <laughs> I've um, heard it too. <laughs> I, I hear it's coming during the weekend, which is good. It means if I if I don't have if I don't want to, I don't have to go anywhere in it. So all good. Yeah, but then I can't get school called off, which is since oh, school yeah. is work. <laughs> Snow day is actually still means something to me. <laughs> yeah. Although they give Understood. me a laptop, so I guess not entirely. Well, we're actually recording this just a, a week after the holidays, um, so that is kind of kept i think both of us a little busy just with some holiday stuff i haven't done a great deal i haven't uh, watched a whole lot of anything significant nothing to really talk about mentioned i think last time or the time before that i was watching some early star trek the next generation yes I watched Encounter at Farpoint, and I was thinking and i was telling myself i'm just gonna start at the beginning and work my way through and (laughs) I click on the titles, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh no, I remember that one, and I, I, I can't do it. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that there, first season, I just, I can't do it. There, there are some of those special, almost strictly first season, uh, but yeah, there are a lot of those in the first season where they're just too painful. The one that always hits me that I, 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 I gotta move past. It is the one where Tasha has to end up in a fight to the death with this other oh, this yeah. other woman, and everything about it is both racist and misogynistic, and I'm like, it's so anti track I'm like, what? <laughs> How did this get Weirdly through? enough, weirdly enough, that's one of the ones that I decided to watch ah! just because and it was only because I recently someone on some other podcast had mentioned that one yeah. for that very reason. I'm thinking, oh, okay, I need, I need to rewatch that. You're right. <laughs> the, the the depictions of the uh, alien planet people. Uh-huh. I don't know what you want to. Yeah, I don't remember the name of the uh, planet or the race that was living there. No, it were just awful, and the whole plot was just ridiculous. And yeah, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't good. The entire episode was built to build up to this fight to the death that was so 60s track. Yeah, anticlimactic, yeah. All while they're supposed to be gathering something that will help another civilization. They're like getting a vaccine or something. I, it is. It's yeah. some sort of vaccine that can only be manufactured on this planet. And like, right. I'm like, really? <laughs> mm-hmm. And there aren't other ways to go about getting this at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just it was just so miserable to watch. And I remember that one always coming up. I'm like, nope, nope, moving on. There's even a lot of second season episodes where I, I'm looking at them and going, man, I thought that was first season. I was like, nope, I can't. Not skipping that one. Yeah, any, um, anything Pulaski heavy is usually in oh, yeah. the ones to avoid. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Tasha Yar as a character, though. The one I, another one I did watch was Skin of Evil. Yes. Which was uh, Denise Crosby's final episode. Made me realize how. I, I'm just, I'm not even sure what they were thinking trying to do a character mm-hmm. like Tasha Yar at that time. Mm-hmm. Because they built up with her the idea that she was on some lawless planet that had rape gangs and drugs and you know how she had to like rise above it all and how the federation kind of was this shining light for her and 
there's some great stuff in that character. Yeah. But you're not going to get it in 1987. No, uh, uh, other than that really terrible conversation she has with Wesley about drug abuse. Oh, right. <laughs> Different episode, but cringeworthy yeah. nonetheless. I remember that. Drugs make you feel good, but <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, it's a false good or I forget. Uh, the, all what I wanted right. is right after them done running that scene for like uh, G.I. Joe to pop up on the screen and knowing it's half the battle. <laughs> Right. But yeah, it just the character was so she wasn't used. No. And I can see why Denise Crosby got fed up with just, you know, she's this strong, supposedly this strong female character. She's head of security on a Federation starship and she's answering the phone. Right. And they gave her absolutely nothing to do. It's it's no wonder that Denise Crosby wanted out. And I also wonder if the way she's dismissed in the episode is reflective of the feelings with the production staff when she decided to leave the show. You know, was she expecting this grand, you know, uh, I'm going to die in battle. I'm going to finally be this strong and this or something. And they're like, no, you're going to be dead before the second commercial break. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and it's basically going to be at the whim of this thing that didn't even need to do anything to kill you. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to get slapped. You're going to have a little black mark on your face, and then you're gone. Yeah, it's just it. It was so unfortunate that they had a character like that, and she was so underutilized. And they they seem like they kept writing backstory for her in the episodes up to that to make you think that they're really going to do something interesting with her. And what's terrible is the interesting stuff they did with the character of Tasha Yar, they did after Tasha had left the show. Oh, yeah. Or the character was off the show when they brought in, like, her sister. Yeah. And then they talked about her and, and growing up and then more about the planet. I'm thinking, where was this when Denise Crosby <laughs> was asking for it? Uh, that that was a different showrunner and many writers before. Uh, yeah. No, in fact, but you're hitting on something. If you actually think about it, the first season of Next Gen knew even less how to deal with female characters than all of 60s Trek. They were more liberated then <laughs> than they were in the Next Gen. It was... It was a little nefarious. It was wrong, everything about it. Like, it didn't hit, sit right. It, we are lucky Next Gen made it out of that damn season. Yeah, so that's just, it's been an interesting, like I said, I haven't gone to all of them because unfortunately so many of them still exist in my head. I remember them so well that when I see the descriptions and I'm like, mm, that one, nope, skipping that one. Well, not to mention, <laughs> we come from the, era when okay when next generation was born and then it was also in rerun several times in syndication we've seen those episodes due to lack of anything else to watch in some cases over and over and over again already so now that we have the luxury to tune around them <laughs> we can go got it no don't need to watch that one <laughs> I have a feeling I'm going to get myself to like third season and then I'm going to get rehooked and then I'll start watching them all the way through. <laughs> well, yeah, because you'll settle into the comfort zone where you're like, oh, this is what it was always supposed to be. Wait, maybe I yeah. need to revisit that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to keep going through the little uh, the thumbnails until I see Riker's beard and the collar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you want the collar on the uniform? <laughs> yep, that's... That's when the episodes start getting watchable. <laughs> when the uh, and when the uniform stops looking less like PJs, <laughs> pajamas. Yes, that's fair. It's a long slog, but yeah, no Troy. Er, Troy, although they did terrible things with Troy during the first season too. But uh, yeah, Tasha, there was a lot of potential there. N no one knew what to do, and. Like I said, we before the show, we were talking about some of those documentaries that are out there. And uh, if you watch anything related to Next Gen, I, you'll learn that uh, like Gene Roddenberry was no way. He, he kind of didn't want a female security. He sure as hell didn't want a female captain. And you're like, you're supposed to be one of the more um, 
I don't know, liberated minds of our time, and you still have your forward thinking. Yes, you're, you're a visionary, and eh, you're still got some blinders on there, dude. It also occurred to me that Denise Crosby deciding to leave the show was the best thing that could have happened for Michael Dorn. It absolutely was, yeah. Because if she were still there, Worf would still be... I don't know what the hell he was doing behind her. <laughs> no, and, and that, that part was tragic because, I mean, they you knew by putting a Klingon on the bridge they wanted to get into that. But they had nothing for him to do while she was there. No. So, uh, I. Yeah. Although that could have been more entertaining. Uh, it, it would have definitely changed the tone, but imagine if, if, if our resident Klingon had go, gone into other work aboard ship rather than security. Dr. Worf, Dr. Worf, <laughs> report, <laughs> report to medical bay. <laughs> Leave a, a little something for the bedside manner, but, <laughs> but he's known for his aggressive treatments. <laughs> How, how, how bad is it, Doctor? Today's a good day to die. <laughs> <laughs> Next on Klingon ER. <laughs> yeah, very short series. <laughs> very, very predictable ending every week. <laughs> yeah. Every, people come in with all kinds of ailments, and it all ends with, Today's a good day to die. Well, no, and if you lean into the, uh, like, first season trek and Klingon screaming every time uh, somebody <laughs> dies that's the end of every episode is all of the Klingons staying around the bed and going ah <laughs> and freeze frame <laughs> yeah. and then cue up the, the fun music <laughs> mm-hmm. I love it I, I think we need to get in and this is so totally an, uh, a, a side story we need to get going yeah, I think we need to talk to some Klingon cosplayers. Next next convention we go to that actually has some good Klingon cosplayers. We're going to we'll talk with them. We'll work with something out. I have not gotten into any of the other Trek stuff. Um I am a little put off by, you know, Paramount Plus. We I couldn't bring myself to pay twice as much to get the commercial free. Oh yeah, yeah. They, I think they do their ads so poorly to try to get you to jump into that commercial free because it's terrible. The show has commercial break spots. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, it was made for broadcast television. Yeah, it'll go black and then it'll, it'll come back on. And then like two seconds later, the ad starts. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that... That's my complaint over on the, the 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 streaming services that are ad based, anyways, like Pluto TV. You watch anything on on there, uh, no matter what was cut, they'll they'll never put the commercial where it was originally intended. I'll tell you, the service that has been the best as far as where they put the commercial breaks, yeah, is Tubi. Really. Tubi TV is phenomenal. The stuff that I have watched, yeah. perfect timing. One, they let you know it's coming. A little little timer yeah. pops up in the corner, just saying add it, you know, add starts and you know three, two, one kind of thing. And it is always like at the end of the scene. It's never in the middle of anything. It's never in the middle of a conversation. I mean, it's it's where a logical place would be for an ad. No, that that's amazing because yeah, picking back on Pluto TV, and I'll watch Top Gear on there. They'll have their star in a reasonably priced car, and they'll go to the video of them driving around the circuit, and then it'll go to ad while you're oh. watching. Wait, wait, what? what? <laughs> yeah. Now there was a few times I'm watching some of these Trek episodes, and yeah, you know, it goes black, and then it comes back. And you know, Captain's log, you know, four five twenty two, and I'm like, and I'm waiting because I was going to hit the mute. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, all right, I guess we're not going to get one. And there's the ad. <laughs> I'm waiting Damn for it. them to be so egregious at some point that literally the ad goes off during the opening credit sequence. <laughs> right. <laughs> do 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 do. And now you should buy Tide. <laughs> da -da -da. Right. I'm waiting to watch the uh, 
the the big uh, season finale. What is it? Third season finale or whatever? Oh yeah, with, best uh, of both worlds. Best of both worlds, where it's like, Mister Worf, ad break. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes later, fire. Yeah, and then end of episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be about that bad at some point. I just I don't mind the ads. If they want to put the ads in, that's fine. But could you actually put them in in the right spot and not one or two seconds after the right well, spot? Well, see, and that's the thing. Like we're talking about Tubi and Pluto TV and whether or not they get it right or wrong. But they're their own entity. Paramount Plus should know better. Exactly. This is their <laughs> it's property. Their content. <laughs> yeah, it was it was my wife that suggested is like maybe they're doing that to try to get you to spring for the uh, the ad free. Oh no, especially uh, especially on Paramount Plus, every Trekkie out there in the world that is just screaming at their TV. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. And if it were just a couple dollar difference kind of thing, sure. they might have me. Sure, but it is literally two hundred percent increase. Yeah, no, that's insanity. Well, like, you're not getting that much gain. And they'll still figure out how to get ads in there somewhere. Somewhere. Oh, you'll you'll have them in the beginning or something, yeah. I always like the limited ads. You know, that just means that you actually have programming. <laughs> yeah, no, because uh, I, I always marvel at uh, kicking off, especially anything that is like an Amazon Prime product or or a Netflix product. Before it even starts, you'll launch into some series of previews that are all for their other content. I'm like, right. okay, I just queued up the one that I wanted. That's all I want to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, other than that, that's it. That's all I've really been watching. No, uh, yeah, on my end, uh, because we've just cleared the holiday season, I buried myself in all of the holiday so shows that I wanted to. so And I like all the irreverent ones like uh, Die Hard and Gremlins and Krampus and all that. And actually an odd one that I find continuing to rise in, in, in my holiday season is uh, Fred Claus. Name sounds vaguely familiar. It's a Vince Vaughn film with... Uh, um, uh, Paul Giamatti playing Santa Claus and it's a ridiculous film uh, but I, I just keep finding that I enjoy watching that one especially there's a scene for uh, Vince Vaughn plays the brother of Santa Claus and has grown up despite being the older of the two siblings in the shadow of Santa and um, oh Blanking on her name. Um, oh, man. Kate something. Uh, she, she She's in that Misery movie. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Continue. Yeah, anyway. Um, she plays the mom of both of them. And, and the dynamic is just too, too much fun. He's irritated with Santa because... Well, because he's Santa and I'm just Fred. <laughs> and mom is all about Nick, Santa, <laughs> and constantly putting down Vince Vaughn's character because he's not as good as Saint Nick. <laughs> it just, it gets so ridiculous. But there's a, a particularly fun sequence where uh, um, Fred is leaving uh, the North Pole and... Uh, He's irritated, and now Santa's irritated at them. So they get in a big, giant um, snowball fight in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of the North Pole, and, nice. and they're just decking each other. And some of the faces that Paul Giamatti makes as Santa throwing snowballs, it, it it's like the devil's wearing the Santa suit. It's insane. He looks crazed. It's just, it's too funny. Uh, for those who are mumbling under their breath, it's Kathy Bates Kathy that you Bates, were looking for you. earlier. <laughs> it was right there, right up until I tried to invoke her name. Yes, I, I had to use that magical thing called the internet. Yes. <laughs> to rem- yeah, well, I was too busy talking to search. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then I guess we'll go ahead and take a break, because I can't think of anything else to talk about. Uh 
We'll take a break. We will listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we are going to talk about 1987's The Running Man. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Uh, necrophilia. Uh, uh, uh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, prudes. I know, really. Right? the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore i am in the most sincerest of senses disappointed in you it takes a powerful goddess like connie jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it i'm still tripping out over that even as a kid i was like i gotta find a girl like that every week i I get a new look of disappointment that i never thought i could get out of unimaginable at 12 years old you should not be watching this obviously at 13 you should not be 14 you should be i'm not entirely sure even 17 year olds should be watching this just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything Dude, that kept little popping history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know, couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How be did a rough you watch one. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. In the year 2017, an innocent man accused of a crime has a choice. Hard time or prime time. Sensational. Perfect contestant. I want him. He must pay or play the running man. On your mark! I'll be back. Go! The highest rated TV show in history. Because they want us to stay. It's a game between life and death. Can you lift? Arnold Schwarzenegger is... The Running Man. He's playing for a prize. The prize is his life. How about the life? The Running Man. The Running Man was directed by Paul Michael Glazer. That's a Starsky, I believe, of Starsky and Hutch fame. And stars Arnold Schwarzenegger, Maria Conchita Alonso, and Richard Dawson. Also making appearances are Yafet Koto and Jesse Ventura. Uh, it is based on a 1982 novel written by Stephen King under his pseudonym Richard Bachman. I remember reading some bit of trivia that when the person bought the rights to the film, they didn't realize that it was a pseudonym of Stephen King. <laughs> They didn't know until after they bought the uh, property that, oh, is that yours? (laughs) (laughs) That's too funny. In the film, after a worldwide economic economic collapse, the United States has become a totalitarian police state. To help keep the populace entertained, the government sponsors a reality game show called The Running Man. Produced and hosted by Damon Killian, the show has convicted criminals fight for their lives running from specially armed stalkers, such as the electrically charged dynamo, the flame-throwing fireball, and the chainsaw-wielding buzzsaw. In 2017, the police helicopter pilot refuses an order to open fire on a crowd of unarmed civilians during a food riot. Subdued by his fellow officers, he is blamed for the ensuing massacre after edited footage is released to the public. Dubbed the Butcher of Bakersfield, Ben Richards is sentenced to a life of hard labor. Eighteen months later, he escapes his imprisonment and tries to flee the country with the forced help of a woman, Amber Mendez, who moved into his brother's apartment after he was sent away for re-education. At the airport, he is recaptured and sent to the running man. 
He and his fellow escapees are forced to compete, and they face off against the stalkers one by one, all while trying to get to a secret resistance group to try and show the world the truth about Richards and, or, or excuse me, about the truth about uh, yeah, the truth about Richards and the government. I have not watched this thing in decades. Really? It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. And I forgot how much fun this movie is. <laughs> Not to bury the lead, but <laughs> this is a fun film. Yeah, it, it is a lot of fun. And with Richard Dawson it, in the role of Killian, um, I a game show host playing a game show host. Not a huge stretch, but man, he throws himself into it. <laughs> Yeah, he does a fantastic job. But, you know, I wonder if that is a bit of a casting choice that doesn't age well. Would people 20 years younger than us watch this film and kind of get it, seeing him as the host? You know what? I think they would. While not maybe having an appreciation for his family feud days, um, you could... I bet you anything you show this to somebody now and they go, they would just ask you a question, were game shows really like that? Because, uh, I mean, he pulls off the game show aspect so well. Yeah. I can almost see it kind of doing a reversal. Someone watching this 20, 25 years younger than us, watching this film for the first time and saying, man, that guy should actually host a game show. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So some lady completely disjointed from what actually had happened. But yeah, no, right down to him out in the, in the crowd handing out uh, Running Man, the board game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the home game. Yeah. <laughs> The whole family was watching this film with me, and we were wondering, what would that entail? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I, I so want one just to, to see how what the gameplay is like. And do you actually have to butcher a family member during any of this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it's kind of like life. You know, you, you land on a certain square or something. I'm like, ooh, oh, oh no, that, what's, not, what's the game? Yeah, life. Yeah. yeah. You land on a certain square and like, oh, you pull a card and, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You've been killed by Dynamo. <laughs> Go back 10 spaces. Yeah. Lost a limb and a turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. At the time, though, in 1987, it was brilliant casting. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and he wasn't exactly known for acting. So to put him in a feature film... Not at that point. I mean, he was known as an actor. He'd been in uh, plenty of things. I probably saw him first in something like Hogan's Heroes. Oh, yeah. I See, that. I am so used to him being the game show host, I had actually forgotten he has been an actor before. And now I picture his character on Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> yep. But he was actually, yeah, Hogan's Heroes, and then he was known just as well for being a game show um, participant and things like the match game. He was always on the match game and he was always everyone's pick uh, to for one portion of the uh, of the game. Any contestants on there always picked Richard Dawson to try to guess whatever word they needed to, to think of. Um, You're apparently a bigger Richard Dawson fan than I knew. <laughs> You'll have to show me your autographed picture someday. <laughs> I, I don't have that. I guess I'm more of a, uh, a 60s and 70s game show fan <laughs> than you. <laughs> well, do I have a channel for you? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I, I probably saw most of them is on the game show network at some point. <laughs> this is Arnold Schwarzenegger at kind of like his... This is like... The height of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, this is him at his Arnold Schwarzenegger -y best. Yeah, I mean, with things like uh, Predator, this, uh, uh, Terminator. Yeah, they couldn't swing a cat and not, you know, and not hit an action film with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. This role is why you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in film at all. I mean. You just want the big, beefy dude beating up on everybody. That's what you needed in this. That's what you got. I suppose. I think his is actually a role you could put just about anybody in. Uh, but I don't know if it necessarily would do as well. I think you need that... I don't know. It's not charisma. That's not the word I'm looking for. 
there is that something about Arnold Schwarzenegger when he's in the movie. Well, and he, here's the difference. Um, it depends on the tone that you want for this film. If you want your hero to be definitively the guy that's going to rule, you put Arnold Schwarzenegger in that. At no point during any of this film, good or for good or bad, there was no stage in which you thought, oh, he might not win this time. There was no, no, none of that. <laughs> good point, yeah. But if you wanted the running man where the hero might not make it, then you want a different actor. <laughs> yeah, I can see this film, if it were done a few years later, having someone like Bruce Willis. Yeah. Where they would very much like Die Hard, where it's kind of like, yeah, he's not going to make it. <laughs> no, and that's part of what made Die Hard work and all of that, is if you had the big dude... And that's the thing. Like I said, you once Schwarzenegger's in there, and that's the guy that's going to win. I mean, you just mm -hmm. know. Yeah, you're not going to have someone like, again, like you have someone like Bruce Willis. By the end of the movie, he would look like death warmed over. Right. Arnold Schwarzenegger never looked like he breaks a sweat through this entire film. I, he calls <laughs> this his warm up to his uh, <laughs> to his workout. I mean, he is attacked by chainsaws, uh, throwing throw. He, he, someone you know, wraps a chain around him and drags him around in the dirt, and he gets up, clean as a daisy. He's fine, well, you know. Well, and that's the thing uh, with Schwarzenegger in this. Literally, if you lift him back out of this, it stops being an action and it starts being a thriller, <laughs> because now you actually wonder what's going to happen. Obviously. The one big thing that this movie predicts is reality television. It does, yes. I mean, almost you can blame this movie for creating some reality television. American, American Gladiators, one of the first reality television shows ever created, was inspired by this film. Oh, yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, in which case, then you continue to spawn them because you have all those... American Ninja Warriors still today. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, which are all based on this. But um, I, I read that the uh, the producers and the creators of American Gladiators literally went to the studio and said, it's like the running man without the death. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was an easy sell at that point. So Yeah, uh, very much so. But no, uh, I... Just, and that's the entertaining element from this film. Well, regard, uh, like I admit fully, not not a huge reader. I didn't read The Running Man, so I, I I will not draw any comparisons between the book and that. But this movie, the way that it sets it, makes it incredibly entertaining to go out and try to kill somebody. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, but just even if it weren't you going out and killing somebody. There are reality shows today that still feel like they kind of hit the running man beat by beat, just minus that, oh, and it's about killing somebody. You're still putting someone in some threat, some danger. You've got uh, shows like Naked and Afraid. You had Survivor. Survivor, which is still around. It uh, Okay. I wasn't sure if it was it's actually still, still going. still around, Yes. <laughs> Goes to show how much I watch reality television. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The Running Man, this is the closest you get to me watching reality television. <laughs> but the idea of, you know, audiences uh, watching other people have to struggle for their, you know, for the audience's pleasure and having some, some role in it mm -hmm. by uh, making bets or being in the uh, audience and, and, and trying to, uh, uh, who's going to be the next stalker? Right. Oh, I'll choose, Di you know, I'll choose uh, Ice Wave, or whatever his name was. <laughs> well, there, yeah, he, well, there's the the one guy that couldn't choose, so they sent both. <laughs> yes, that's true. But the very first one, it was the, the guy on the skates was the first stalker that was sent through, and I... Um, oh, yeah, no, I, uh, a Sub-Zero. Sub Zero, thank you. Ice Wave, I think, is a uh, robot in, uh, in Battlebots. Uh, my mistake. Battlebots is just uh, 
the running man with robots. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, BattleBots is the running man. You're allowed to kill them because they're just robots. <laughs> no one asked the robot, but... <laughs> Since we're on the topic of how this fits into that, uh, the thing I want to give it at least a little credit for aesthetically is like this was supposed to be what, 2017? 20, uh, it was 2018, 2019 because there's 2019. like 18 months mm -hmm. after the, the, the beginning of the film. Yes. Um, so, so, yeah, you're looking at maybe 2019 about. Mm -hmm. um, and the aesthetic and the fact that he is like when we see him flying around in a helicopter and it is it's a standard st sort of army issue helicopter and the fact that it's supposed to be 2017 and it hasn't been decked out in all sorts of crazy futuristic stuff and the fact that they right. didn't try to do that they actually kind of nailed it i mean you, you this one was actually set fairly far out in the future. That's a 30 year gap um, from the time this was made to the time to which it's supposed to take place. And they didn't go nuts. They left the world still looking much like the world. And I, I know we're not on a political show, but I think if we were to watch this maybe a year from now, uh, some of the geopolitical stuff might actually be real. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I, I don't want to go into a lot of political details or anything like that, but, you know, around 2016, 2017 or so, there was some political strife in this country that, uh, <laughs> Could have and around to, the world. A, 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 of which we may still be on that ro road to totalitarianism. So the notion that the U.S. could see themselves in that position, not necessarily foreign. No, no. A little sad, but that's a different conversation. On a lighter note yes. of uh, possible predictions of this film, I noticed uh, home automation was again a thing. Yes. In this film, uh, the woman comes in and you know tells her apartment to turn on the lights and start the coffee and all that stuff. Which, interestingly enough, uh, at which I was thoroughly amused by, because I I did I actually. Uh, of the date of our recording, I watched it on New Year's Day, right after I installed some of my own home automation. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, no, I, I can, uh, in a part of my house now, I can turn on the lights by just saying so. And I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> they did get that. Yeah, so I thought that was fun. Um the booking the travel just from home, uh, like the whole thing. Mm. Uh, they weren't so much internet, but that was more or less what it was. Yeah, you know, I didn't even pick up on that. And that is something I have to try to be a little bit more uh, cognizant of when I watch these things is I'll see something like that. And it is so commonplace to me today. Yes. It's hard to like think. Oh, yeah, that wasn't a thing then. <laughs> no, in fact, right down to, well, granted, he did. they had a barcode on a badge that allowed them to travel, but mm -hmm. that's no different than you taking your phone and scanning a QR code to do something. So, yeah. um, no, they kind of nailed that part. The, the part that <laughs> where as much as they got stuff like that predicted fairly well, the one that was still kind of laughable uh, was... Um, she goes back to the uh, the studio and all that, and she's going to look for dirt uh, to see if Richards is right about his history. And she actually goes into a, a cat a card catalog to look for computer files. So uh, yeah, I was giggling yeah. a little during that. I'm like, <laughs> okay, uh, I'm not saying you're wrong about the fact that they'd be digitized, but the notion that you were going to go look at them in a card catalog was a little silly. And the fact that the card catalog is practically la labeled for, uh, see treachery here. <laughs> like, I mean, it's literally labeled for him yes. and, oh, here's how it really happened. Uh, like, yeah, you're expected to have a little sticker, do not use, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. damning for corporation. Right, and, and the fact that she just let herself in there by opening the Rolodex thing, I'm like, it's okay, security's not great. <laughs> 
No, the 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 futuristic part of that was how small the oh, little data discs well, were. That's true. They were flash Because you this size. was yeah, this was the age of like what five and a half inch floppies. True. So no, you're you are very much correct. So the fact that they were uh, at least a, a flash size a drive size was impressive. Not yes. how it would work, but it was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, you know, they couldn't quite they couldn't quite take that next step nope. into thinking that it was just going to be digital, that you'd have to have some sort of physical media. Nope, and, and I got to give it credit. Uh, we didn't see a single laser beam. Uh, we saw the dynamo. lightning thingy. <laughs> yeah, Dynamo and his throwing lightning bolts was probably the biggest stretch as far as, like, the technology goes. Hey, you can still get a thing that'll do a static discharge. Maybe not quite as dramatic as that, but you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. And he might not survive wearing it. <laughs> right. And, and in, um, this, in this movie, he didn't. <laughs> I got a kick out of the two women uh, buying a Coke from a vending machine. It was $6 a can. That's a little too on the nose. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's not that far off. <laughs> <laughs> not quite that much, but God, have you bought a pack of soft drinks lately? <laughs> I have bought a 12 pack and <laughs> it's practically, it's almost a dollar a can anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, not, I know they were trying to make a point, but they weren't far off. <laughs> no, no. But I, I got a kick out of that. In a little bit of dialogue, I think it was uh, Richard Dawson's character, uh, Damon Killian talks about the quake of 97 is what caused the uh, like 400 square blocks of LA to become this, arena oh yeah yeah how how close are we <laughs> to some of the bigger quakes in california not as close as i thought uh i think the biggest one that around that time was in uh, 1989 the uh the santa cruz california during the 89 world series yeah was a pretty big quake brought down the uh the overpass yeah, and, yeah, and everything I so i was thinking like wait wasn't it about that time <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, it was a decade out yeah no <laughs> But still after the film. So, yeah, we were still in California. So really saying there was a big quake. You really, you know, it, it wasn't too far of a, of a throw. At the time of this recording, I'm pretty sure the planet just revolted because there seemed to be an earthquake all over the place. Literally yesterday. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to say that this thing predicted, I forgot all about in the film. And it's one that kind of surprised me the most this thing predicted deep fakes oh it did that's right i that blew me away we're like oh yeah this blah blah model and we have to put their face on the actor i'm like holy crap <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no i actually it wasn't until you just brought that up that's see that's one of those that for me it just kind of slid in there that it oh. Okay, they they use special effects and all like, but no, we're now, like doing that on a daily basis. Yeah. Now, obviously, they're a good you know decade or so too early, or I'm not 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 a de yeah about a decade too early for the for the time that this film's taking place. But that is something that is happening now in the 2020s. So not even a decade, maybe yeah. only give them another five six years. Yeah. And uh, I, we're there it's like that was almost eerie <laughs> well yeah no and actually about four years ago was already starting to be a problem so they really weren't far off of that mark no no that just that really blew me away of all the things that for this thing to kind of get right <laughs> no uh, that, that that's absolutely true and then uh i don't know i I'm still marveling at the game show itself, like the dancing. I mean, I mean they mixed like every future game show ever because that throws in dancing with the stars while you're also doing American Gladiator and all. It just th they hit them all, all at the same time. No, you're right. No, it. I like I'm saying. I truly believe this film may be the birth of reality television. Somebody saw this and went, you know, we could make something like this work if. Well, now you're just giving me a reason to not like this film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Can't we just uh, make this fantasy again? 
fun fact, uh, all the uh, dance sequences were choreographed by Paul Abdul. I saw that. Yeah, no, I, like that was not a name I was expecting to see on the screen. I and didn't know that till now. Fairly, fairly early gig for Miss Miss Abdul. Yeah, absolutely. That that was a uh, that was kind of cool. Um, we kind of uh, we talked about Schwarzenegger a little bit, and then I went right into the the, the predictions and mm-hmm. and and what they got right and wrong and everything. We didn't really talk about some of the rest of the cast. The rest of the cast, I think, is well. That scene, that's the problem. Outside of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the rest of the cast is serviceable. Yeah. Uh, Jesse Ventura is cool to see because he's in a lot of he, you know, he and Schwarzenegger in films. Yeah. They, you know, the Predator. Running man, you know, fine. You just want you expect to see him, <laughs> right? No, if you're gonna if you're gonna have an Arnold Schwarzenegger and not have a big enough dude for him to face off against, it's almost no point. <laughs> I love that in the end he kind of didn't. Yes, no, that 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 part was great. Uh, as well, the stuff with Jesse was amazing, anyways, because the fit. <laughs> The fitness video where where he's not actually doing any of the fitness routine. He is just strutting through, flexing and going, hoo <laughs> Like, that's just ridiculous. But yeah, no, the notion that uh, if he couldn't face off against uh, Ben Richards mano and mano, he didn't want all the... The, uh, the crap that they were going to strap to his body. Yeah. yeah, he comes running, coming out in that ridiculous armor or at least half of it yeah. <laughs> he's like i don't need this crap <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he it, becomes the deep fake yes but yeah him is the uh the retired stalker doing the uh the the behind the scenes and locker room interviews and then and then trying to uh do like well i remember when oh i'm sorry <laughs> someone cuts into him i'm sorry we gotta go because apparently they're entering the first you know phase i'm like he w- he did that so m- he was so good at that. Yeah. yeah, I'm only just catching as we're looking at uh, IMDb here at the moment. <laughs> I didn't realize Mick Fleetwood was actually in the in the movie. Mick Fleetwood and Dweezil Zappa. Yeah. If you if you watch out for him, you'll you'll catch him. Yep. The uh, the female star of the film, uh, M- Maria Conchita Alonso. Mm-hmm. She felt like someone that I'd seen before, but I go through her filmography and I've not—I don't think I've seen anything. Uh, she's done more uh, Spanish language work than she has English language work, I think. Uh, but I mean, she wasn't in. She was in Predator Two. Yes, she was in Predator Two. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get to go with Schwarzenegger though. No, I think there was just a sort of. Um, because of the accent and the age, I, I think I kept thinking of like uh, Selma Hayek. I, I I get that, but no, I, I I've seen her in other stuff before. But you're right; it's not as much as you would think. Which is actually kind of a shame because I thought she was actually really good. Yes, I really liked her. I think she I think she did pretty well, you know, going against Schwarzenegger. I think they played off each other really well. There's plenty of Schwarzenegger movies where whatever woman is in the film is clearly just there just so that there is a woman in the film. Um, but yeah, she she actually seemed to play the she was she was the part. Uh, I, I genuinely got in a sense that uh, she was intimidated by him and then never fully on his side, but trying to understand. Oh, that's mm-hmm. the thing I remember her from. She was in the movie called McBain. I'm not familiar. Uh, well, Riff Tracks has torn it apart fairly well, but it's a Christopher Walken film. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. This is interesting. I just I saw this little uh, bit of trivia or whatever. At one point early in the production of the, the of the film, Christopher Reeve was actually attached really? to play Ben Richards. Really? What do you think? What do you think this film would have been had it been Christopher Reeve? Oh my God, they would be a completely different film. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be more of the um, he he may not make it out alive kind of feeling. Yeah, th- th- this is if we yeah it, it would be very much that. Um, I'd like to think it'd be a lot more dramatic, um, and. 
f- far fewer one-liners. <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, you know what? And that's something, too. Apparently, um, early production, it went through some director- directorial changes. Yeah. Uh, Paul Michael Glazer wasn't orig- wasn't the original director signed on. Oh, interesting. And when he came on, uh, I think there was a quote from Schwarzenegger somewhere too that felt that he directed it like it was a television show, and that it lost a lot of its edge. Hmm. And so I'm really curious that had it been a different director and someone like Christopher Reeve, and I'm guessing following the novel a bit closer if it would have been a little bit more darker and have a little bit more in the way of like social commentary and not just a let's have uh, fun and blow things up action film yeah and that could have been an interesting take on it because yeah uh there there's nothing groundbreaking here in the running man uh while we do get some neat elements and some interesting predictions for the future um, everything is pretty cookie cutter in the f- film overall. In fact, every instance where Schwarzenegger has to face off against uh, um, a stalker, it, it, it is a very repeatable process each and every time. Yeah, yeah, that's bringing some over the top stalker. He almost uh, kills Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger gets the edge and dispatches him. Yep. And rinse, rinse and repeat. wash, repeat. <laughs> <Yep>. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually find myself sort of um, finding not all that much to talk about other than what we've already talked about about this film because it is on its surface and really not too far underneath. It is just kind of this fluff film. It is an 80s action film. There's not a whole lot of substance to this. No, no, no. no. Uh, and, and you're right. We're struggling a little bit to have something to say because, I mean, we both like it. It, it, it. It's fun, but that's all it is. is it's it, it, it's just kind of a fun watch. There's The thing that stands out for me to this day in this it, is just the music, that musical bit, the, the little keyboard thing that goes anytime we have to watch Schwarzenegger move around a corner or something. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it, 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 it's a tone and it's an action film and it isn't anything else. You know, I saw a little bit of trigger right before we recorded that there was talk of a remake back in 2021, which as far as I know has not happened. No. I would actually like to see this, remade or, or another film based on the novel remade and try to uh, get some of the more darker elements and and not just be a a shiny happy action film well yeah and it's actually kind of got me curious to pick up the the novel to yeah to actually yes. dig in and find out what more was there beyond this fluff um they they obviously captured the spectacle that was probably a part of the Running Man story, but left quite a bit of the actual story somewhere else. So I'd be curious what that is. Yeah, uh, very much. I'm kind of curious myself. I guess that now's as good a time as any to go. We had got a few social media comments on the film. Yep. Uh, over on Facebook, Cameron says that it is the king of the fight to the death films. While it had uninspired direction and was annoying when it and was annoying when I first saw it. It grew on me due to the humor, quotes, ideas, and satire ringing true despite some iffy production values and still having some lowbrow quality to it. <laughs> this is another one which had some Blu-ray issues with picture quality despite being re-released three times. Well, that's interesting. I don't know. The, the version that I watched was actually pretty decent, so maybe that must, that must have been one of the, thir- the final time they got it right. Maybe. <laughs> Patrick says it's a great movie, but the darker ending of the book would have been better, in my opinion. So, yeah, another, you know, add it to the uh, kind of. Yeah, now I need to know. In, <laughs> yeah, it kind of baits you into, into seeing that. Uh, I believe this is Jay from the Rating Room podcast on Twitter says, I rewatched The Running Man a few months ago when I was working my way through the Arnold Schwarzenegger back catalog. 
enjoyable film and a shout out to Yafet Koto who played Mr. Big slash Kananga in the Bond film Live and Let Die. And that, of course, the rating room, their first season of podcast was all about James Bond. So they, <laughs> they had a nice, like, two or three hour episode on Live and Let Die. <laughs> there you go. On Discord, uh, Steph from the Film Gazers podcast says, I had never seen or heard about this one until about a decade ago when my husband showed it to me. I feel like it's definitely one of the campier Arnold movies. I thought it was terribly bad in a fun way. Yeah. I told her that you are not wrong. I think that is pretty much the perfect... That should be on the DVD cover. <laughs> Bad in a fun way. <laughs> but what did the critics think of it at the time? Because I know this was only a modest success at the box office. It gained like an extra 10 or $20 million over budget. It was not like a big hit. So I'm curious what the critics thought of it. Well, I think the critics are going to support that a little bit. <laughs> so starting uh, at, at the top here with uh, Empire, Ian Nathan. And keep in mind, this is supposed to be a good review. <laughs> <laughs> it says, never managing to look more high tech or further on from 1987 than, well, high tech trainers. Uh, this Arnie vehicle still runs its bloody course without dropping many gears. A brainless, breathless thrill. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not wrong. No. Uh, and then moving on to the New York Times, Vincent Canby. Has the manners and the gadgetry of a sci-fi adventure film, but is at heart an engagingly mean, cruel, nasty, funny send-up of television. It's not quite network, meaning network the movie, uh, mm -hmm. but then also doesn't take itself too seriously. Well, obviously it didn't do that either. Uh, no, not at all, I'd say. No, not with literally. Literally, Arnold had to say a one-liner at the death of every single stalker, and they got worse the further it went on. Yeah, yeah. Then we have Chicago Sun-Times, while he was actually at the Chicago Sun-Times, Roger Ebert. The movie's problem is that all of the action scenes are versions of the same scenario. TV host Dawson introduces a killer and his trademark weapons, electrical shock, fire, chainsaws, etc. And then Schwarzenegger faces him in battle. The one element of the movie that is not standard and that does have some energy is the TV show itself, with Dawson's performance as the egotistical sleazebag host. So, I mean, obviously picked up on where the strength was, and it was yeah. The Running Man. Yeah, as sad as it is to say, the actual show, The Running Man, would today be a tremendous hit. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and that's if you left the killing in. <laughs> yeah. But no, I can't say enough uh, uh, since Roger pointed it out. I mean, seriously, Dawson was a formidable bad guy in this because it wasn't about the strength that he brought. It was the power he wielded and the fact yeah. that he could just get pick and choose who he was going to pit in a death match. It was amazing. He did a great job. Yeah, because his character had the power because it was like the the thing that was kind of keeping a very... It was the thing that was kind of keeping the United States together. Right. That if, if, if the running man went down that was going to be the last straw and everyone was, would start be turning on each other. And when they decided that's not a good idea, they're going to turn out to the government. Yep. Turn on the government. Oh, and, and I'm going to use this moment to just pick on one of my favorite things that we didn't discuss, which is the court appointed theatrical agent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned that because my son <laughs> Of all the things, that when he said that, my son turned to me. He's like, court appointed? <laughs> <laughs> he got a kick out of that. I did, too. When it was said out loud, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> There's something even more. I don't know why. Now that's even funnier <laughs> than it was in 87. Yeah. So No, that was brilliant. There are... <laughs> 
yes, the the one liners at the dispatching of any character are is corny, and I the they don't need to be there, and they're so some of them are so forced. Oh yeah. Um, what happened to so and so? Ah, uh, he had to split. Yeah. <laughs> but the best line isn't a one liner from Schwarzenegger. It's a rebuttal to a one liner from Schwarzenegger. Right before he goes down the chute, yeah. he tells Killian, you know, he he throws out his famous "I'll be back," yeah. and Killian looks at him in the only in the rerun. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, I love that line. That was perfect. <laughs> Brilliant. Segwaying back to uh, the remaining uh, things because I am only now getting to the back. Oh, sorry. When when you gave Ebert, I assumed that was, you usually end on Ebert. Ah, uh, no, but I could I couldn't resist because Ebert was the middle. Okay. <laughs> so now moving into the lower end of the pool. <laughs> um, Washington Post, Dezon Thompson, I think that's how that's pronounced, uh, uh, not the Thompson part. Um, you want to know if The Running Man is a good time macho show, right? <laughs> Stay at home and watch professional wrestling or Miami Vice. Same director, Paul Michael Glazer. <laughs> sure, there's blood splattering and bullets riddling and big boys bagging biceps. But through the dry ice haze, Running Man is surprisingly boring. I'm quite sure if I'd have gotten there, but okay. And then Miami Herald, Hal Bodecker. Arnold Schwarzenegger's latest, The Running Man, is a septic tank of a movie. <laughs> this atrocious futuristic drama forms a dumping ground of bad acting, derivative writing, and stomach-churning violence. The movie stinks. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, well, he didn't sugarcoat his feelings about this. I think Steph has it right. It's, it is bad, but it's in a fun way. You, you have fun watching this film, despite the fact that it's the nuts and bolts of it are terrible. Well, yeah, because I mean, theoretically, you never want to think we're going to be at a point where a game show about killing people would be a real thing. Unfortunately, I don't know how far off from that we really truly are, but yeah. But the point is is 1987 you wanted to think that wasn't a thing that was going to ever happen, so it was just kind of fun to spook yourself with it and have some good fun watching Schwarzenegger deliver his terrible one-liners while he kills people. So, how can you not have a good time at that? <laughs> to uh put a little uh, clarification on something I said earlier. Mm -hmm. I was talking about this being kind of the birth of reality television. I should say it's the birth of like modern reality television. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because reality television, you go back to things like a candid camera and I mean, reality television existed before this. Yes. But this is definitely the birth of what I would consider modern reality television. True. And, and, and tr the true fusing between a game show and real people. Like taking it beyond just answering trivia questions. Right. And not, not real people like 1979's real people. Are you actually <laughs> talking about, no, I'm, there was a real people no, show. No, 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 no. I know there's a real people <laughs> show. It's, you know, we've named everything to the nth degree. I can't get away. I mean, people in their lives say like, yes. like the notion of survivor where you take Joe Schmo, anybody, and you put them on an island and say, here, eat bugs for a living. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. We Joe Schmo was also a reality television show <laughs> on Spike TV. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, we're running out of names to call things. <laughs> All right, so is that it? Is that yes, the, the, that, the... That, that is the... I think when we get to the movie stinks, we've hit the bottom of the uh, the critique. Yeah, all right. Well, I think that one was a little bit harsh. <laughs> uh, maybe not wrong, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm with them on the bad acting, the derivative writing. Stomach-churning violence, a clear... Uh, we're a bit more jaded, I think, these days, so... You know, that's true. That maybe in 1987 that would have uh, sit a little differently, but after after we have seen things like Saw, <laughs> Game of Thrones, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, honestly, this kind of stuff could pass on television with almost no editing. Right, like, uh, that's the thing. This would have been another one of those movies where I would have seen it as a matinee or something, or something on broadcast television when I first... So it would have been cut to ribbons anyways, but seeing it in its entirety... Um, yeah, there's not much missing from when it was edited for television. If anything, it was edited to get the commercials in, not to take any of the content necessarily out. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, yeah, it was an interesting watch. It was a fun watch. I'm glad I watched it. Uh, like I said, it had been forever. And it, it, it's nice to know that those films that you kind of uh, you, you knew and remembered as being fun watches from your childhood are still fun because we've definitely hit yeah. on a few where we thought were really fun and we watched again and went, this is really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are not at that stage anymore. This is not one of them. This is a turn your brain off, go have a good time. And then shockingly parallels a way, way more of our future than one would have thought out of this particular film. Yeah, it really does. If anyone has an any additional thoughts on The Running Man, please send them our way, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to all the social media sites, and you can leave your comments there. When we get back, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. We're going to look at a 2009 film called Surrogates with Bruce Willis. And this film uh, per- tries to predict 2023, which, of course, we just left. So we'll see what they got right and what they got wrong. <laughs> and from the description, I'm pretty sure I watched this, but I don't rem- I can't. The, I either watched this film or I read the book it's based on, or I read something else that has the same, you know, uh, premise. I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we're starting to achieve the capacity of your brain. Is it all in there or not? <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll be back in two weeks with that one. So uh, do stay tuned and we'll talk to you then. Bye, everybody. See ya.